Honesty and transparency are how we operate. Supply chain challenges are not always easy, but the commitment from our team to take on the responsibility is unwavering. When you encounter a challenging supply chain crosswind, the whirlwind of options and variables rise and fall. You seek the shelter of predictability. You seek to find the eye of the hurricane. That's where we live. Dunavant, logistically speaking, we are at the center of it all. to truck it it's time for your nooner with dooner and weighing in at a total combined weight of 500 pounds of stupidity it's dooner and gilbert today what's up donnie you're good sir how are you how are you doing man <laughs> it's friday it is friday you know yep. this isn't just any friday this is a uh, a big friday in the dooner household because there's a game my, like i train my kids on this game called breath of the wild zelda breath of the wild it's the first game they learn how to play with there's there's six and eight now uh, it's been a six-year wait with an extra year delay, but Tears of the Kingdom has finally dropped, Donnie. And look, these nerds are out in full force. Look at this line going on outside the GameStop. Are you one of those dads that, like, beats the fool out of your kids in video games and is proud of it because they're six and eight? No, no. So I, I like, I, you know, I take a dive. Not, not always. Like, once in a while, I get to show them who's boss in, like, Street Fighter Two or, right. or Soul Calibur. But no, it's been a great experience. And, like... I got to tell you about Breath of the Wild. People, a lot of times, they, they crap on video games. They think they're stupid. But I go into the store, and you know when they sell, like, STEM toys? A lot of those are complete freaking junk. Don't waste your money. Go out and spend $70 on Tears of the Kingdom. You're, you're doing physics on there. You're learning mapping. You're learning relationships. You're learning uh, mon monstrof monstrophagy. I don't know. What does it call when you study monsters? Monsterology. <laughs> Although, you know what, Donnie, it's gotten a 10 out of 10 everywhere except for Eurogamer, which gave it a 4 out of 5. Now, I don't want to call them Euro trash just yet, because they may have a reason. Look at this. They didn't fix one problem in the last game. You still can't pet the dogs in Tears of the Kingdom. Ooh. Yeah. I'll give it an 8 out of 10, then. Yahoo, <sighs> Yahoo News reports. This is how big this game is. So, we talked last episode. Nintendo Switch is kind of on its song swung, on its last legs. People have been waiting for a new system. It's, it's taken a while now. This game is going to make over a billion dollars in revenue. The last game sold 29 million copies. This could be the highest selling game of all time. What do you think? The last time I played a Nintendo, you had to pop the thing out, blow on it. Yeah. Put it back in, try to get to work, bang on it. You had A, B, up, down, left, right. That was it. Got to get back into it. Well, everybody out there, to all you moms in supply chain, logistics, trucking, happy Mother's Day to you. Happy Mother's Day to my mom, my mother-in-law, my wife of my... Two beautiful sons. We promise on Sunday we, we won't play too much Tears of the Kingdom. Great holiday. We're, we're going to talk about that on the show today, too. Ah. Yeah. We gotta, so. But before we get there, there's something we talked about the last episode. It is a viral trend involving fruit roll-ups and ice cream. And uh, we're going to give it a shot right now. I haven't tried this yet. Justin tried it yesterday. Let's get your roll-up up, Donnie. Yeah, you've, you've made me nervous on this one. Well, here you go. I know. Well, see, we put the video up about this on TikTok. We, if you missed it, so in Israel, there's a bunch of people who got busted bringing in hundreds of pounds of fruit roll-ups. They're selling for $8 a pop for one of these little bad boys right here. And um, people got busted, but people on TikTok were making fun of us because I guess there's two viral reasons for this. I'm not going to mention... Um, one of them, but it's a bit sexual in nature. I wasn't aware. So uh, we're going with the ice cream version of this. Who would think we watch different videos? <laughs> we, won't be, we won't be demonstrating uh, any other versions. I got watermelon. And I'm not sure how this is going to go because it's watermelon with, like, Neapolitan ice cream. But apparently it's supposed to make it crunchy. I'll try and capture that for you right here in the microphone. If I can get my, uh, my ice cream scooper out here. All right. You know what? I'm going to grab, like, oh, it's a little melty. It's a little melty. So be, beware. Beware, Donnie. I'm going to give you a little less because I, I think I put too much in mine. Get out of there. There you go. All right. Wrap that up like a dumpling. We'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. Hold on. Let me take a little out of here. <laughs> it's too much. And it's melty. All right. Wrap it up. Is it getting hard? It's supposed to get hard. That's, like, the whole thing about this. Yeah. That's the, it, oh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Okay. Gonna ruin my career. Mmm! Now it's not corn. Not bad. Not bad. I don't know if I would do this all the time, but uh, yeah. Guys in the back, 
I'll set this over the side here. You want this ice cream? It's melting anyway. I got some ice cream and some fruit rolls for you. Come and retrieve it. It's all you guys. All right. On the show today, we're talking to NASA's Katie Rogers about how the state agency's supply chain works on Earth and in orbit. Uh, Mother Truckers, this one's for you. We got IMC driver trainer and mother Megan Turner. She joins the show to speak to why pulling containers is a great job for mothers. And she's going to debunk some of the myths that women can't be great drivers. You, we're going to do a data-driven market breakdown. We're also going to talk about truck defaults. There's a lot going on. Turn on the show. We'll tip the band. We'll hit the market. So supply chain challenges are not always easy, but the commitment from the team at Dunavin Logistics to take on that responsibility is unwavering. Dunavin, logistically speaking, they're at the center of it all. Visit them at Dunavin.com. All right, Donnie. Bill Packets. Bill Packets online. He's a guy who works in supply chain here. He says, during the depths of COVID, we booked a few loads from southeast to northeast around a dollar a mile, which is not good or healthy, even in a bear market. Rates aren't that low right now, but the sentiment might be even lower. Mm. Let's talk about it, Donnie. Let's look at this first chart here. What is going on with the rates? Yeah, I don't agree with this dollar a mile from southeast to northeast because northeast normally pays a bit more, but I get what he's saying. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, it was... Rates were tough during 2019, um, and of course they jumped up in 2020. But if we look at what's going on now, the blue line is our NTI, and I've, I've put up the NTI held the, the line haul only, which is basically like our, our all-in average, but taking fuel out. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> we use thousands and thousands and thousands of lanes in order to come up with this. This dollar fifty is not the average rate of every lane in the U.S. We should know that, but using this as a measurement, we can tell which direction and what's going on with average spot rates because of what this number right here is doing. What is that number? Where are we at with the uh, with this national spot rate average? Well, for almost a month, it was at a dollar fifty eight, and it held for quite some time. And then I got nervous, and I started using the word stable stabilization. Yeah, I'm like, hey, we're getting close here. We're getting close here. Well. We crossed into May, and it's in the last 10 days, it's dropped eight cents further down. Yeah, it's steep. Like, I'm looking at that decline here, and it, it took another dive down the hill. It's very aggressive, and we see that. Now, <clears throat> you look at the, the um, green line and the red line, those are um, contracted, average contracted rates, kind of the same situation. We've got thousands and thousands of lanes, and we're watching the prices of those. Now, those are about two weeks behind because of our data is, uh, is two weeks lagging. And if we go by what we see from previous months, those two are going to, again, we know that contract rates have been coming down. We've been talking about it for months. I'm expecting to see maybe quite a, a, an aggressive fall in both uh, drive-in and um, reefer when we hit the 1st of May and those new contracts go into place. Mm. Now, we got to be careful because as a carrier, if you go out and you sign a great contract for you right now, a high rate, do you think that's really good? They're probably just not going to give you any volumes. Well, let's talk about volumes. What are volumes looking like right now, Donnie? All right. So we bring up, I got a, I got a chart with OTVI there at the top of it. We give, we index volumes at 10,000. We want to see them a combined over 10,000. Over 10,000, thumbs up. Below 10,000, thumbs down. Well, we're at 10,000, almost 10,600. So we're still above that. So volumes are good. They mm -hmm. could be a lot better. They could be 12,000, 13,000, 14,000, but they're, they're not. So we got to deal with what we have. The problem is we, we got about 25% too much capacity in the market. During COVID, when the spot rates blew up, everybody and their cousin and their uncle's cousin's child's friend went out and bought a truck, wanted to try to jump in on these high rates. Yeah. And we got way too much capacity, and we see it every time there's a big boom. So we just have to adjust right now, and it's going to be basically the adjustment's going to be you're not making any money, you walk out and give up, or the bank repos your equipment. So what's the difference with the Van Outbound Tender Volume Index? Show this next one over here, and uh, tell me what we're looking at. All right, so I've broken down our volumes. That 10,600 is pretty much the reefer, which is there on the left, 1340, uh, plus your dry van, 7413, and there's a – there's some flat bit in there that we're not showing, and you know, basically, that it all adds up to the ten thousand six hundred. <clears throat> the majority of our freight, one of the biggest areas, is dry van. That's why it's got the bigger number, seventy four thirteen. Uh, reefer is a little bit smaller, more niche. 
But when I see the number go up, when I see the number go down, I always want to break it down, Dooner, and see what's driving that. And there'll be times you'll see reefer might be going down, but drive-in may be going up. And you're knowing, hey, you know, know what's going on in the markets. Is it reefer driving change? Is it drive-in driving change? You need to understand what is driving these changes. And you can do that in sonar with breaking it down either by volumes, rejection rates. You can break it all down by drive-in and reefer. Well, then let's look at rejections. What is going on with the van outbound tender Ooh. reject index? It looks like it's as low as it's been. Is this... This doesn't go far back. Is this the lowest we've been at? I believe for an all-time historic low, I believe we've hit an all-time historic low. I believe it was around, for the total, both of them, I think it was like 257 or 258. Uh, and I think we're down to 250, breaking down to 2.30 on drive in and 2.90 in reefer. Now, reefer, <clears throat> reefer is, it's, it's been at historic lows, but... Reefer did not drop below 9% during the uh, bust of 2019. Ooh. Now, there's a couple of different things that's a little bit different on this, Dooner. Now, with low volumes, all the mega carriers are sucking up all the freight they can, accepting everything. But we still have diesel fuel prices at $4.10 and, $4 and a gallon, I believe, today, or four oh nine. Mm. Well, since you don't get uh, – now, I showed you what a $1.50 plus fuel – well, look at some of these contracts that were showing up before at 230 or 240 plus fuel. You know, it's a lot better for them to stay on their, their volumes right now and stay away from the spot market. Uh, avoid the spot market like at, at all cost because you're going to make a lot better money. There's a 90 cent difference between spot market and contracted rates right now. So stick with your contracts. Now, that's going to come down during 2019. That average was about 42 cents. So... That tells you, Dooner, that these contracted rates by average will probably come down another 48 to 58 cents per mile when all this is cycled through. Look, this is, this is too bleak for a Friday. It's making my goat scream over here. Can you, can, can you give us uh, like some advice here? Is there any good lanes we can run? What, what are we looking at on this map? Show I, the map here. I got a map here, yes. So I've looked at our, I've taken our drive, our, our, our volumes and our rejection rates, and I've thrown them here on, here on a map. The darker blues are the higher rejection rates, and the shaded area, that's the volumes. You can see the Midwest is just sticking out like a sore thumb. And that would be probably the best areas to be putting your trucks in. Now, if you, had to, if you, if you can run them in the Midwest, that'd be great. If you're going to try to run to different regions, I'd probably pick the Southeast. I know it's tough. I know a lot of people hate it, but that's one of the better reasons that you can make better money when people don't like going to a certain area. And the weather's great here right now. What? And the weather's great here. Right Where? Now. The southeast. Really? 75 and 100% humidity? I'll take it. I won't. I, I like, like 65. I like to be sweaty next to you, Donnie. Yeah. Well, what about, what about if you're out here? What if you're holding equipment? What if you're thinking of buying equipment? What if you're thinking of expanding Ooh. your fleet? What if you're thinking of potentially selling your company because you don't think you can weather the storm for the next year? Take a look at what is going on with this used truck price index. Tanner DeHart, he tweeted, three-year-old truck prices have fallen $55,000 since their peak a year ago. A $140,000 truck is now worth $85,000. So the big concern here, right, because all that payment, that 5 to 6% interest, it's only gone towards principal. You're not doing anything about uh, the, these escalating costs. It's I wanna, a big I, challenge. I want to walk up to the TV and touch it just so I can see my chart, but I can't. Dooner, used truck prices never should have gotten high. It's what they did. Yeah. And there's a combination of a lot of things that pushed it up there. Number one, mega carriers could not get their new trucks, so they had to hold on to their equipment a lot longer. Uh, parts were backing up because the ports were backing up. You couldn't get new, all the new parts in that you need. If you were driving a truck and your uh, water, heat, water heater, your water pump went out, six to nine months waiting on that part, but you still got to make the truck payment. Oh. Rental truck companies, trucks that rent out, they were rented out. Trailer rental companies, they were rented out. So you, this huge demand looking for these trucks really pushed these three-year truck prices to the max. And as I watched them climb and climb and climb, I kind of drew a line about 110, 115, saying if you're buying over this right here and you don't have a lot of money to put down, you're going to be in trouble when this flips. And now it's that time. So dropping 55%, yeah, they're almost getting back to where they really should have been. But if you're looking to buy a truck, I wouldn't buy one right now if you, if you don't have to. But hold on. What about the one – like that's an easy decision to make because you can just avoid doing that. What about the, one, the people who did buy trucks and are now completely upside down on these loans? What does this mean for them? They're done. They're out of business. They, 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 they should have 
They should have made a better choice. Bad decisions make great stories, they say. Uh, Dooner, you overpaid for a unit. They didn't understand the boom-bust cycle of freight, and they went in in the boom. Maybe they went in at the last half of the boom, not even the first half. The last half, they made a little bit of money. They're going to stick it out. They're going to try, and they just found out, hey, why did my four-mile lane just go to $1.85, and how am I going to make my payment? It's a tough thing to swallow. And the banks, the banks are going to be getting in the trucking business here soon. They're going to be selling used trucks. And they don't want to be in that business. Well, banks haven't been doing so well themselves either, Donnie. No. Anything, any hope you can leave us with so we don't have to just end on such a depressing tone? Know your cost. Yeah. Know where you need to be so you can find those lanes to keep your truck profitable. A lot of people don't understand their fixed cost, their break-even points, and what they need to make need to make money. And they get in there, and they just get behind, and they just lose it. So know your cost and try to find these lanes. Find the markets that are changes. <clears throat> Get outside. This is the box right here, Dooner, on the thing. Yeah. Get outside. Your, think outside of your box, Dooner, because if you just stay in line with everybody else, you're going to follow everybody else and follow them in the ground. These guys that get in, in, innovative and change, they're going to stick through this. Well, hey, wise words. Thanks for helping us understand the market, and thank you for sharing a fruit roll-up with me, Donnie. Appreciate your time today. I'll never forget that in my life. I will not. Have a great weekend. Thanks, sir. <laughs> Take it easy, sir. All right, everybody, meanwhile... This, this is my house. I have two dogs and I have a cat. And every time my cat does something like this, the girl dog that I have, Miss Elizabeth, she just freaks out. She just runs away. She knows that she might, like, I, we know she didn't do it. We know it was the cat, but she's afraid someone's going to yell at her. Um, Randy Savage, he'll just, he'll just stand there laughing. Look at that cat. Look at the cat in the box. She's smiling at you. So much hate. All right. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Let's talk to some great moms in freight who are doing the work out there. It's Megan Turner, Director of Driver Recruiting, and Felicia Pipkins, Driver at IMC. F ladies, thank you so much. Little cowbell for Mother's Day. Thank you. Hi, hi Megan. Hey, how are you? How's it going? Well, it, it, it'd be going better if you could see me, probably. There we I go. I can see you. You look, you look good. Hey, uh, let, let's, let's meet you. Um, Felicia, tell us a little about yourself. I noticed you're in a beautiful cab there with a nice pink curtain. <laughs> uh, that's a container. I decided oh. to park beside a pink container. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Smart move. I thought you had a nice curtain. I was like, wow. <laughs> um, what was the question again? I'm sorry. I... Oh, just introduce yourself. How long you been driving for IMC? Where are you sitting right now? Where's that container? Uh, I'm, I've been driving for eleven for twelve years, and I'm in the Laporte, Houston area. Very, very cool. How about yourself, Megan? How long? I, if I understand correctly, you started your career in a driving school. I did. I spent nine years at a truck driving school. Um, actually, I started when I was eighteen years old in this industry. So I've been in the industry about fourteen years. Um, spent about nine years helping drivers, you know, change their life, get their CDL, and then started helping drivers become owner operators and got into that side of things. And then that led me here. And now, you know, helping drivers have their dream job and be home every night and wonderful for mothers. That's for sure. Is there, is there a, um, a stigma or a perception that moms cannot be good truck drivers, Megan, and are you here to dispel that myth? <laughs> well, I think everyone has like this idea of this old school trucker in their head, you know, that doesn't shower, that's gone over the road months at a time. And um, it's just not the case anymore. I mean, um, there's so many dedicated lanes and dedicated runs to where mothers feel safe. They don't have to sleep in their trucks or stop at, you know, unsafe areas. And I mean, let, let's face it. I think the biggest thing is women are small and they're they're scared of this big piece of equipment or this big truck. And um, most of them can't drive a stick. And that's I mean, past five years, industry really has changed where we're, you know, mainly automatics now. So that's one less thing with safer equipment. And, um, you know, these dedicated lanes like we have drivers are home every night and on the weekend and. They don't have to worry about, you know, safe working environment to where they're driving overnight or sleeping in their trucks or, you know, they can shower at home and not have to shower in the truck stops. But, I mean, mothers and mother motherhood and careers and having a career is just tough in general for me and, and for women drivers everywhere. But, um, you know, at IMC, you're, you're actually able to 
t- drop your kid off at daycare and pick them up in the afternoon. And, you know, it's, it's could be a, you could do a shuttle run that's, um, you know, that's an hourly paid job to where you're home daily. So there's just plenty of opportunity that I think women are just scared of the unknown. And if they can put that to the side, then, you know, there's a lot of things that they could do in this industry. Well, Felicia, you're not scared of the unknown. Were you a mom before you became a truck driver? Did you become a mom while you were a truck driver? Tell us that. How did Tell us that part of the business. <laughs> no, I was a mom before I became a truck driver. And Megan is right. That it seems like women are scared to be out here, but we're not. We, we love a challenge. And the trucks are big. and But actually, it's just like driving a, a pickup with a trailer on the back. So um, as long as you can handle uh, backing in, then you should do fine. You, I mean, it should be okay. But, um, of course, you just got to watch everything that you're doing as far as backing up and stuff. You know, God bless my wife. She does. She helps manage a lot of the kids going to school, a lot of the grocery shopping, a lot of the, uh, the infrastructure of what goes on around our house. How do you manage, how do you manage kids and, and, and life outside work? It's already, I'm not over the road. It's already a challenge for me and I work locally. Um, I, my kids are grown. So, um, I, I raised mine before I got into the industry, but actually there's three different shifts that you can work on. You can work, um, early morning, you can work, uh, mid afternoon, and then you can work at night to still manage a home life. Wow, that's well, Megan. What is the good? Like, you are the recruiter over there. When do you approach women differently than you approach men? And if so, how does that approach change? What is the good for women in this industry? I just think women in general, like myself, Felicia, we can all do a better job, I guess, of pushing women a little bit further than we have to for men um, because it is a challenge. And, and I think the unknown definitely is, is a big part of it. But um, if, if we can get past it together and, and like today, as we speak, I've got, I've got a woman, um, recruiter that's doing a ride along with a driver so she can get f- more familiar with the industry. And I've got a lot of, uh, women recruiters and processors in the industry. So I think we all do a better job in, in of, of uplifting women. And so it is a tougher conversation than it is to recruit women than it is to recruit men. But I think if we can get past the safety aspects of things and, um, you know, we, we all need more women in the industry. So if we can get past the safety aspects of it, that, that will ease a woman's mind to be able to come on board with us. Well, Felicia, you're a success story. You said 11, 12 years now behind the wheel. What is, what's the good of it? What has kept you in the industry for so long? We're talking about a, a business that unfortunately had, for, for men, has 100% turnover. I don't know if it's even higher for women. I just know in general it's, it's 100% turnover. What has clicked for you? Uh, what's clicked for me is the flexibility. The money is great as an owner-operator. And I, I came in as an owner-operator, not a company driver. But um, the flexibility and it's it's a career change, which I look at it as, you know, it's my future and it's my job. And, you know, it's more um, my business as well. So I'm running my business this way. And that's my livelihood. Fair. Well, you know, Megan, you kind of touched on this. You, you, you mentioned some of the bad. What is what can we change? What do we need to do to make the industry safer and more accommodating to women drivers and to make your job easier recruiting them? I think if we can all look out for each other more, like even look out for each other more on the roads and, um, you know, be aware of our surroundings and, and be able to. Um, to help and and help drivers, the men be able to help the women drivers when we're in need. I think we could just all lean on each other. Um, as far as the bad goes, I mean, transportation is a roller coaster. I mean, there's so many different moving pieces that happen in transportation that it's never something that is the same thing every single day. But, you know, I just want women that are listening to know that I mean, this is a career. This isn't just a job. This isn't this isn't an everyday job that you do. It's it's something that, you know, if you can start out and you can get your CDL and get your feet wet, then one day you can be a successful owner operator like Felicia. And we can all work hand in hand together. You know, there's uh, as, as a recruiting director. I mean, there's no greater feeling in the world than to be able to help someone. And I I get the luxury to do that every day. I get to better someone's lives and help someone. So um, if, if we can do a better job of up, uplifting each other and leaning on each other, then I think that'll take us a long way. 
Felicia, what myth about moms and trucking just makes you shake your head and, and, and get angry? What, what, are, what are people so wrong about? Um, I don't think they're wrong about it. It's just, I, I guess, I don't know. I'm going to have to visit that one. I haven't thought about that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, maybe we Megan, what do you, what kind question. of, Megan, what kind of pushback do you get when you try to present this type of job to, to moms? What is some of the, the negative feedback you get or the fears that you hear? So here at IMC companies, I mean, what we're doing is we are going into the port. Um, we're, we're moving containers that are coming from um, overseas or on ships that are then going on to railroads that um, you know, we're moving to our distribution centers or dedicated customers, and there's a lot of moving pieces to that. So if you're new to the industry, I think it's just a lot to wrap your head around on, you know, what to do, where to go and how to do it. So um, I don't think you you know that, that it, until you get out there and do it yourself, you know, what all entails and in, in, into your routes and into your day. Um but yeah, I mean, Felicia, you know how to do it. You, you've been doing it every day of your life for a long time. So um, I, I, think, I think you do a, an awesome job here for the company. And if anything, I, we appreciate you here on Mother's Day. Wow. Wow. A little, little cowbell for Felicia. Well, Felicia, let's, let's, let's pay it forward. What, let's pay it forward. What advice do you have to moms who are considering a career in trucking? Uh, my advice is for uh, moms is... To just be aware of your surroundings when you're um, out here, um, as well as get the training that you need so you can be a successful driver. And that's that's very important because I wouldn't have been able to do this without the training and without going to school to learn how to um, hook up to a trailer um, and the, the ins and outs of what I should be looking for, making sure it's locked down. Um, uh, just being aware of everything that's around me. And I mean, most of the time when you're out on the road, they are um, cars, they're truckers. They, they'll let you know if there's something going on with your truck or your trailer. Um, so you will pull over to, to make sure you get the correct um, necessary things that you need to fix your truck so you can move on down the road. Uh, Megan, before I let you go, someone who liked some ladies like what they heard. Maybe their kids are going off to college in September. Maybe they want to get behind the wheel. Maybe their kids are annoying at the home and they want to get on the behind the wheel right now, right? Where, where do I send them to? How do they get some information? All of our social media. Um, you can check us out at imcc.com. Get a lot of information. We've got about 45 locations throughout the U.S. So, I mean, we've got terminals everywhere. So drivers are, you know, within a 100 to 250 mile radius of their house, which is what's perfect for females. So, yeah, give us give us a call. Get my recruiting team to, uh, to give you a shout. We'd love to have you on board. Felicia, you drive safe. Have a wonderful Mother's Day. You as well, Megan. Thank you both for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for stopping by. Nice ladies over there. Happy Mother's Day one more time to all of you out there. Here we go. Send us the hard stuff. That's what Dunavin Logistics says. When you run into that really challenging logistical nightmare that keeps you up at night, call the good folks over at Dunavin. They make headaches disappear. Visit them at Dunavin.com. Speaking of headaches elsewhere, look at this monkey. It's out of control. How do you even stop a monkey like that? Like when my dog, when Randy Savage goes crazy, we have a little like water spray bottle to get him to calm down. And he seems to be pretty receptive to that. Hey. <laughs> this monkey is just all about himself here. Gotta call the animal control officer. He <laughs> just keeps going, this is terrible. I like him though. Although, remember that lady who had the chimpanzee in California like 15, 20 years ago? She gave it some Xanax and it like, took apart her friend's face. Horrible, horrible story. I don't know. Cute to look at. Michael Jackson used to live with them, too. Anyways, Katie Rogers, International Space Station, OC2, Cargo Mission Integration Branch Manager at NASA. Your names are always, a, your, your titles are always a bit of a mouthful over there, Katie. <laughs> yep, that's true. That's true. Well, first of all, ha happy Mother's Day. Thank you for coming on the show. It's a beautiful day. Where are you calling in Thank from? Thank you. Uh, I work in Houston, so I'm calling from my office. Uh, just that I'm, I'm I work in every day here on the Johnson uh, on site at the Johnson Space Center. Very. When what is your responsibility there? Because we had a pre-screening call and it sounded really cool. It's right up our alley here in the logistics space. 
Yeah. So listening to the uh, the women that were on before me, I think we're the ones that um, pack up all of the the hardware into crates and then uh, call for their services to help us ship our stuff uh, where it needs to go. So basically, I manage the cargo integration and operations office for the International Space Station. And basically, we just put together um, integrated packages of hardware to send up to uh, to deliver to the launch site to launch to the International Space Station. Wow, that sounds um, that sounds like a complicated supply chain. How does like how does your day to day function, for example? What is like a typical day at NASA for a cargo mission manager like you? Um, so uh, as I'm a, a manager, so I do a lot of uh, people work and making sure that I've got all of the the things, uh, meetings and and whatnot covered. So that's that's probably the dull part of my job. The fun part is. Uh, Working with the hardware owners, we've got different um, hardware specialties. There's uh, folks that worry about computers, folks that worry about uh, the hardware that's needed to, to perform a spacewalk, uh, other organizations that were, uh, make sure that we've got what we need in the way of support for the crew, food, clothing, those kinds of things. And so we work with those different um, hardware organizations is what we call them, but they're just the hardware owners to pull together what the right set of hardware is to send to the space station next to, in support of uh, the crew. And then uh, we, we try always and um, launch as much science or research hardware as we possibly can because the ISS is a national laboratory. Wow. So, so science is king. When people, yeah, when, people, when people think about NASA, I think the immediate thought is like, oh, yeah, cargo going to the International Space Station. But you have a big supply chain right down here on Earth where you have to facilitate all these bases and get that cargo together in the first place, how are loads managed and moved on Earth by your team? So we have a, the main packing facility here in Houston. So we ask all of the hardware owners to send their uh, individual hardware items to our, our packing center here in, in Houston. And so what we do is we basically put together the, the hardware. Well, we, first thing we do is inspect it to make sure that um, between when it was shipped from the hardware owner's lab usually, uh, to our packing facility, that it's, it's in good shape. Um, and then we basically pack it up based on requirements that the hardware owners give us. We, As you can imagine, we work with a lot of very, very sensitive hardware. And so sometimes things have to launch in custom foam. Sometimes things have to launch in multiple layers of bubble wrap. And so we put all of that uh, together. We pack them in cargo bags that we're looking at right now. And um, those cargo bags uh, get put in layers of what we call pink poly. Uh, and then we put them in crates and they get sent off using just commercial freight forwarders to, to the launch site. And we actually have a point to point delivery service. So they go, uh, the folks that deliver our hardware are actually going on site and delivering to a visiting vehicle. Do you have an, let's, what, what's the scale of this? Do you know how many like truckloads per year NASA is running to keep this supply chain moving? <laughs> you know, I don't, yeah, that was in the, I'm looking at my notes. I actually ran some, uh, some numbers of the thousands of tens of thousands of pounds that um, that we've done. Let's see. We launch about um, 7,000 to 8,000 pounds of cargo per launch. And I would say we have four ish launches per year. So I think that means we're launching over 30,000 pounds of cargo to the international space station every year. And I mean, that's that numbers. That's just a broad brushstroke type number that, you know, it changes a little bit based on exactly what we're doing. But that's it's quite it feels like a lot to me. Well, yeah. Well, how do you pick these? Because you said you use commercial freight forwarders, right? How do you go about picking them? Um, we have a contract in place and those folks go off and uh, solicit the inputs from the freight forwarder. I'll, I'll be honest, I am not. uh as knowledgeable in that piece of how they make those selections. I, I don't know if we're calling individual freight forwarders or uh, if there's a, like a, a website that they're using and, and putting out the solicitation. But I do know that it's, it's always custom critical and it's always point to point delivery. You've got strict um, temperature requirements. We make sure that um, <clears throat> we get the temperature control with reporting during our shipments, because, you know, it, when you think about it, this is hardware that the crew's going to interact with. So we've got to make sure it gets there undamaged uh, and, and rides in the environment that's expected for the hardware to, to work. And so it's, we, we are very strict about all of our, all of our shipments. 
Speaking of those shipments and, and getting them there on, on Earth, I mean, space is, a, is an amazing challenge, but Earth isn't always the easiest place to get stuff to either. How many bases does NASA no. have? How many bases, ports do you have? And, and what is the hardest one to reach? Um, but, you know, we actually launch um, hardware uh, internationally as well. There's uh, We work with the Japanese Space Agency. They have a launch site in uh, Tanagashima, Japan, which is a, a small island off the off the southern coast of Japan, and that is by far the hardest place to deliver hardware to. Not because it's <clears throat> a, a difficult or anything wrong with it. It's just it's hard to get things from here to there. It takes a number of days. Um, we've got language barriers to deal with. Uh, we we normally send the shipments out um, using air cargo or cargo air, I guess. And uh, we have had some things we had to sh- uh, ship over on a boat. Uh, but it, you know, once it lands, now we're taking our class one flight hardware and it sits in, it sits in a customs bond waiting to clear customs so that it can, it can begin the next leg of its journey. And that's, that's nerve wracking, you know, for uh, a team of engineers like myself that want to control absolutely every single thing we do to have my hardware sitting in a bond room at an airport is, uh, is nerve wracking, let's say. Welcome to the, the joys of uh, global trade, customs bonds, and uh, customs holds. Waiting on those releases, it, it, can be, um, it can be a big challenge. So you get all this stuff over to the base, right? What, what are these payloads, right? What is this cargo? And what, what, are, you sending, uh, what are you sending up to the ISS? Um, so like I talked about, the, I, I can't necessarily talk about the, the details of all of it, but you know we do a ton of research um, in the areas of uh, materials, crystal growth, uh, space, we, we're doing a lot with um, fiber optics right now. We do a lot of human research. We've got a, a unique uh, perspective in, in going towards the moon and Mars as future destinations. We need to make sure we understand <clears throat> how the environment of uh, outer space over a long term affects affects people so that we'll know how to properly uh, uh, plan for uh, for future missions to those destinations. So on Earth, but, yeah, think- science is the key. Drug well, development. I sorry, I'm looking at my notes. Oh, because, sure. Uh, yeah, cancer treatment, um, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, interesting cancer. So, how does space? In, I guess to, because you'd have to have medicine for people if you're going to live somewhere else, right? Or if you're going to be long term, so you have right. to study how like the impact of of cancer or vi- or whatever would would interact with right. a uh, zero gravity or a space base, right? Well, and one of the one of the unique things is you can grow cr- perfect crystals in space and perfect specimens in space because you don't have you're developing them in a, a zero gravity environment, so you don't have gravity uh, pushing on your samples or crystals or whatever you're doing uh, to alter them. So you actually end up with being able to get research done faster using the environment in outer space. And so some of the drug development, the cancer treatment uh, strategies that we're developing today, are used on Earth. Well, on Earth, you use you use trucks, right? And you use boats, and, and like yeah. boats, for example, you have 20-foot containers or 40-foot containers. You get 53-foot trucks. You have that giant beluga plane, but all of these things have <laughs> cargo limitations. Let's talk about a rocket's cargo limitations, though. What do you have to account for and, and take into, uh, into account? How big can a payload be? Like, what is your, what is your upper-tier weight limit that you can even send up to space? So that is a, that is a very interesting question. So we've got the visiting vehicles... Um, with certain limitations and the limitations of each individual uh, visiting vehicle is one built by SpaceX, one built by Northrop Grumman. We've got the Japanese Space Agency uh, building their uh, their rocket and cargo module. And then also uh, Sierra Space is building one. Boeing's got one. And so each of those has got uh, unique limitations, let's say, or unique features, depending on how you want to look at it. I mean, so I can't really talk about that, but what I can tell you is we pack things into cargo bags. We're, we're looking at one of them right there, and the cargo bags have sizes. So the visiting vehicles are are built uh, using the specifications of our cargo bags, and our bags are built as and designed and tested as containers to make sure that um, throughout the the launch and reentry, they will keep everything inside, even with the cargo straps. So if something came out. <clears throat> cargo strap came off that bag is is good to go it's not going to let any of the the items inside uh come out and so um our biggest bag is uh 52 inches by 20 inches by 35 inches and that doesn't seem like a lot um in the way of the you know tens of thousands of pounds i'm sure we're moving around uh, every day on earth but for us it's big 
right? I mean, it's we've got a number of modules um, on the space station, and, and there's a limited amount of, of space because we've got hardware to keep the crew alive. We've got computer networks, <clears throat> hardware that um, allows the, the crew to talk to the ground, video cameras, science tracks, things like that. And so we want to make sure that we're flying um, the right hardware and keeping the right hardware on ISS to make sure that um, we can continue dev- everyday operations and, and make progress towards our research goals. And so um, it doesn't seem like it's a lot, a 52-inch cargo bag, but to us, it's it's ginormous. Is it right? is, like how sensitive is this? Is this the kind of thing where um, pounds, ounces can make a massive difference at launch? What what is the importance of engineers in loading this cargo? Yeah, so you know what's interesting because I'm actually an engineer. I'm not a, a logistic person by by trade. I have an engineering degree from uh, Texas A&M University, but um, we we worry a lot about mass and, C and center of gravity of, of what we're doing. So we we will um, put together a, a plan for the hardware that we think is going to launch on a particular mission. <clears throat> and then we'll send that over to the, the visiting vehicle, whoever it, whoever it may be. And they will work that into the plans with the propellant that's loaded. You know, they're going to load on the rocket and the weight of, of all of the stages and all of that. And they will create a trajectory. They have to work through the, <coughs> excuse me, FAA um, for flight performance. And so every, believe it or not, every ounce matters. Uh, we have some flights where, um, depending on uh, the other things that we're flying, uh, we have a mass limitation, meaning the the things, the, the plans that my team puts together can only weigh a certain amount. And we are not allowed to go one ounce over that. Um, because otherwise we're jeopardizing our ability to get the whole set of hardware up to the International Space Station, which is obviously not what we want to go do. And so we are very um, mass mindful. Most of the conversations that we have are, is it going to fit? Can I fit it in a cargo bag? Can it fit with the other stuff that we have? And what does it weigh? Am I going to break any rules if we, or break any um, limitations if we if we add this particular item? So we spend a lot of time talking about that. What, do you get to catch, catch a break on it when it gets up to space? Because you know, then it's then it's weightless. And I'm also thinking too, because like the ISS, right? They they showed uh, they showed a little video in there, but you don't have like a warehouse inside the ISS, or or do you? Where do you store all the cargo when you get up there? It um, stays in. You know, we do a sort of an exchange. So the the visiting vehicles that arrive also have to depart. We don't keep them there forever, and so. <clears throat> the capsule we were looking at there is a, a SpaceX capsule. It's one that um, arrives at the space station. We remove all of the content, and then we pack everything back up, and it departs. And that's what you're watching right there is the separation from ISS. And it's going to reenter <clears throat> in either the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. And then the, the content of everything that we uh, returned is going to come back to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And my team will be on hand to pick all those items up from uh, – at the space center and send it back to Houston. And and then we go through and we unpack each individual cargo bag and make sure that we take, <clears throat> we can get each individual item sent back to uh, the person that asked us to return it for them. Well, that's some it's interesting reverse valve or a pump or a tank or a, yeah. Well, that's some crazy reverse logistics. You know, you, you think about it and you get returns. Sometimes they'll send you a box and a label you can put on. And you have a, a giant space cap- capsule for doing these returns. Does that right. come down solo or does someone ride with that capsule uh, back to the, to the splash down in the, the Atlantic or Pacific or wherever it drops? It is uh, unmanned. But the think about it this way. The, the crew is doing our, our packing. They're the load masters yeah. for this. And so we send them really, really detailed packing plans of, uh, which item is going into which bag, and then that bag is going to return into a particular location. And all of that feeds together um, into the, the return performance. And, uh, you know, you've got to hit a particular spot um, in space to make sure that your uh, reentry is going to be safe. And then once the capsule drops down in the, in the ocean, there's recovery boats there with the Coast Guard to, to pick that capsule up. <clears throat> and then we it um, we unload. We actually return frozen science, uh, refrigerated science. You saw the um, the tomatoes there; those returned uh, the way that you're looking at them. And we have a we're able to have the the science in the hands of the the returned science experiments in the hands of the uh, experimenters 
hours after splashdown. So it's yep. it's truly trying to 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 get the the return to science um, so that we can start taking a look at uh, the results of the experiments as soon as we possibly can. We don't want the science to, to degrade at all from being in the effects of gravity. <clears throat> now, the ISS team, like they can't self-sustain on their own food that they grow, or can they? How much food goes up there? How much do they need to survive during uh, during these missions? Ooh, that's a great question. That's so specific. Um, we we grow some things on orbit, um, but we are it is it is not self-sustaining. The ISS isn't really set up with a, a landscape that you would see from say. <clears throat> the you know movies or television shows that um, make it look like we're farming the moon or Mars yeah. or anything like that. So we do send the food up in a it's in a thermostabilized uh, sort of like MREs, not exactly, but um, and and then we have to rehydrate them and uh, the crew eats those. But they do get a play a hand in um, what they what they want to eat. And they, so they select the the food that they would like us to launch for them to the space station. But yeah, we do. Uh, send all of the food, well, I say all, most of the food up for them. They don't receive significant calorie intake from a handful of uh, lettuce leaves or tomatoes or anything like that. But still, that's great research for us. And we're happy to to see that <clears throat> it's it's possible and capable. And that's that's why we're we're looking ahead to the moon and Mars and making sure that we've got those capabilities in place. It's exciting, honestly. Do you need more nutrition in space? I was watching a documentary on the ISS and it made me realize like, I'm too lazy to be an astronaut. Apparently, you have to move your body and work out like four <laughs> hours a day when you're up in space or else your, your muscles atrophy. Is, is that true? That's true. I don't know what the specifics are, but yeah, they do spend a significant amount of time uh, exercising because you don't want to to come back to Earth and just and be debilitated because there's without any, you know, the force of gravity on your 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 body every day, your your muscles and your uh, and your bones just start to start to degrade over time it doesn't take very long before you would um you you would be so atrophied you would have a hard time moving around how does all this help us back here down on earth well that's what we were talking about the the science research so it's um you know the being able to grow those perfect crystals or have the perfect samples and and things of that nature really have uh been uh, played significant roles in the drugs research that's going on. One of the other things um, we, <clears throat> because I, you know, we talked about the the weight of everything that we do. Um, we end up miniaturizing a lot of a lot of hardware. Uh, you'll take a pump that you know on Earth it can be as big as it needs to be. It doesn't really matter. But when you have to launch it into outer space and then put it into a limited <clears throat> size space capsule, you want it to be as small and light as humanly possible. So through the 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 hardware developments like that, you you end up with things like insulin pumps uh, and and items like that. So it's um, I think I have read a statistic one time. It's been a while though that every dollar that the government puts into NASA, six more come out in the commercial industry just with the the way you have to figure out new ways to do things um, and mi miniaturization of hardware, science breakthroughs, and things like that. We're actually feeding the the commercial or you know capital capitalism in the US through the through the discoveries. Wow, what what's your next big mission that you're that you're working on? Well, let's see. So the next one is uh in May is going to be the the launch of uh, an Axiom 2 mission. You can have uh, four commercial astronauts uh, visit the International Space Station. We've got a cargo mission slated to launch in early June. Um that is going to bring up a new set of solar arrays to uh, give us additional power capability on the International Space Station. And that's really cool. And those are heavy. And so it was, it was so uh, interesting or timely that you were talking to me about mass because those these additional solar arrays are very, very heavy. And so that's actually limiting the amount of uh, cargo or, or hardware that we can put inside the capsule on this particular on this particular flight. And we've got <clears throat> some spacewalks associated with getting those installed once they arrive on ISS. Um, let's see, through the summer, we've got a, there's a couple of Russian vehicle launches, uh, Progress and Soyuz, got a new crew coming up in August. And that's probably as far there's a, another logistics flight in the summer or cargo resupply flight in the summer. And that's, um, that's probably as far as I can 
uh, without a calendar in front of me. Yeah, no. Uh, tell Wait, you did you say? Did you say Russian? No, no. I'm curious. Is there a? Uh, <coughs> mm-hmm. uh, isn't the, it seemed like there'd be some contention between NASA and Russia? Oh no, I mean not in the indi- not in the yeah. way of not of space. space. Everybody's everybody's professional. You know, we we uh, jointly work together on the International Space Station, so we uh, we don't we don't trade or talk politics with them at all. They've got, um, you know, a service module, FGB, their, their Soyuz and Progress vehicles come and go to the station, just like our vehicles come and go to our parts of the station. Our crews get along very well, integrated activities, the whole, the whole thing. Wow. Well, our before... relationship space-wise hasn't, hasn't changed in the last few years. Interesting. Well, before I let you go, I ask everyone from NASA this, what is your favorite space movie? Got to be The Martian. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, growing the potatoes, listening to the. Although I thought the book was better than the movie, but um, I got to see uh, a screening of that movie before it uh, it was released, and uh, I loved the, we'll say, futuristic view of uh, the Johnson Space Center when they showed the the main building and the security gates as you drive in uh, is not really representative of the way it looks today. <laughs> but we loved the we loved the CGI makeover of uh, of the Johnson Space Center. Thought that was great. Well, I, you know, I'm really, at the end of the month, the last Friday of this month, uh, NASA's on again, and they're talking about their 3D printed like habitats that they're building on Mars. It's going to be super fascinating. I can't wait. It's going to be like our our Martian yes. episode. It's it's going to be yes. so neat. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for so teaching. So we've had 3D. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, we've had 3D printers on the station as sort of a test bed for how do you really do it on Mars. So it's it's sort of a. Uh, like I said, it's a national laboratory. It truly is. So that's where you want to test out your capability before you commit and send it all the way to Mars. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Have a great Mother's Day weekend. Thank you for sharing this knowledge on how NASA's supply chain works. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Take care. All right, everybody. It's Friday. Before we go home, good news, bad news. Bad news and good news. I hope they're okay. I had some good news in the mail. I got uh, my What the Truck hockey sweater over here. Just arrived. It's a one-off custom. People are interested in these. I don't know. We could always make more, but this is a one-off custom. I dig it. Super comfortable. All right, let's get into it. (laughs) Good news. (laughs) You're driving in a truck. (laughs) Or you're driving in a car. Good news. You're driving in a car when this happens. It's a cruel trick. It's a cruel trick they're playing on. Papa here. <laughs> you know what? The other the other thing like like that is when you're driving on the on the highway and someone's towing a semi going backwards and you're driving towards it, but it's pointed at you. It's very uh very mentally disconcerting. I almost feel like this girl in this video. Roll this clip right here. <laughs> Must be a new driver. Can't handle the semis passing her. Oh my god! He's totally clear in his lane, too. Oh, my God. I don't know. Maybe you got to stick to the surface streets with that one. (laughs) Let's take a look at this Toyota Helix in action. Look at this thing. He is just riding the Raging Rapids up the side of a mountain here. For the audio listeners, he's just getting splashed all over by this, like, flood water. But he's canoeing his way through it. He's aiming for the shallows. He's pushing right through. He's going behind a bend now. Let's see if he makes it out the other end or if he just washes down this thing. I mean, this seems like an absolutely horrible idea, but I, but I guess once you're already stuck driving in raging water like this, the worst thing you can do is stop because then you're going to get washed out. So this guy, he's just got to commit to it. I mean, Toyota, they, they need to drop these helixes here in the U.S. and use that as a commercial. I mean, what... What kind of a cell is that? An amazing one. You got me. Let's take a look at a container. I don't think they send these up to, to Mars. I'm not even sure where they send these things. It's like a Russian nesting doll of containers. Look at this guy as he opens each one. <laughs> no, he's not done yet. No seals on any of these either. Would you seal each one of these if you were uh, running containers? Like, it keeps going. Ah, uh, you know what annoys me about that video though? They stop it 
before he gets to like the last box. What is in there? Is there a diamond? Is there anything? What is the smallest box? Who made, whoever made that video, please, please show it to us. All right, here's a, here's a nice little video to see before we send you home. This is over in Jacksport. Take a look, it's a drone capturing some cool shots of the one stork arriving in Jacksonville. Uh, Jacksport says the vessel departed our terminal yesterday at noon. They enjoyed welcoming one stork to Jacksonville and look forward to seeing the vessel and its sister ships very soon. I think one service has started coming to Boston too. If you saw that pink container that I thought was a curtain, like the, like the fool I am, that was actually a, a one container that uh, Felicia was sitting next to. You could be sitting next to me, eating fruit roll-ups, wrapped in ice cream, June 21st and 22nd, over in Cleveland, Ohio, at the future of supply chain. Don't miss your chance to shape the future of supply chain to bend it like that fruit roll up before you put it in your mouth. How do you create a blueprint for the future? On June 21st, June 22nd in Cleveland, Ohio, that's when you do it. And right now you can save 25% off your tickets. I'll be there. Uh, everyone you know from uh, the industry, everyone you know from Freightways will be there. Go to live.freightways.com. Go and book yourself a ticket. Before you do that, if you haven't done it yet, you're an audio listener, subscribe to this show. You're a video listener. Go to YouTube, subscribe to the show, Freightways YouTube. Um, I don't forget. Oh, you streamed on TikTok today. So shout out to the TikTok listeners. Find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner. Take care. I'm going to play Tears of the Kingdom. See ya.